have your Bibles, turn with me to Exodus chapter 11. We're going through the story of Moses, and last week we looked at the first nine plagues. We're going to look at the last plague today, the Passover. I think the point of what we're looking at today is obedience. God spoke, some people heard, and they made a decision to trust and believe what God had said, even though it didn't make sense. And even though they didn't have all the why questions answered. And because they were obedient, they got to live that night. Because obedience is always a matter of life or death. And it may not be immediate death. But ultimately, obedience is going to lead to life or death for each of us. Let's get to the text. If you're new here, that was my fluffy introduction. I'm ready to go. Exodus 11, verse 1. Now the Lord said to Moses, one more plague I will bring on Pharaoh and on Egypt. That word plague in the Hebrew literally means a stroke or a blow. I've got one more stroke or blow that I'm going to bring. This is going to be different. I will bring on Pharaoh and all of Egypt. After that, he will let you go from here. When he lets you go, he will surely drive you out from here completely. Speak now in the hearing of the people that each man Ask from his neighbor and each woman from her neighbor for articles of silver and articles of gold. It's kind of strange, but if you go all the way back to Genesis chapter 15, verse 14, when God's telling Abraham, I'm going to make a nation out of you, he tells him in verse 14, by the way, you're going to be enslaved as a nation, and I'm going to deliver you from that nation, and you will come forth from that nation with great treasures of gold and silver. And now we see the fulfillment of that here. They are about to go on a journey. And what Moses is saying is, I want you to go, and you got to understand this, they're still slaves. I want you to go to your masters, and I want you to walk in the house, and I want you to say, I've been serving you for 30 years, I've always liked that necklace, give it to me. <laughs> it's like hitting the ATM on the way out of town on a trip. Now the question becomes, what makes these folks think that these folks who are their masters are going to give them this stuff? What changed with the Egyptians from the beginning of the plagues till now? Well, nine plagues changed. What changed on the fact that the Israelites would do what Moses said? Whereas if you remember back in the story when Moses first came to Pharaoh, he said, God has said, let my people go. And Pharaoh says, I don't know this God. The answer is no. And then Moses leaves Pharaoh And then when he and Aaron are walking out, literally the Israelites are standing there saying, may God curse you for making our life worse. What changed from those folks to now whatever Moses tells them, they do it, even if they don't understand why? Nine other plagues. When you see the Nile turn to blood and you see frogs in Pharaoh's bedchambers and you see darkness for three days and you see the things they've seen, you start to believe that maybe that God is stronger than our God's. And if there was any doubt left, this last night is going to change all of that. Look at verse 3. And the Lord gave the people favor in the sight of the Egyptians. Furthermore, the man Moses himself was greatly esteemed in the land of Egypt, both in the sight of Pharaoh's servants and the sight of the people. Who was not still esteeming Moses? Who does it not mention? Pharaoh. Remember we talked about as the king goes, so goes the people. All the Egyptians are going, man, this guy's for real. All of Pharaoh's court, their God's God's stronger than ours. Pharaoh is still not broken. The night will break Pharaoh. Verse 4. And Moses said, thus saith the Lord, about midnight I'm going out into the midst of Egypt, and all the firstborn in the land of Egypt shall die. This is Moses telling Pharaoh this. From the firstborn of the Pharaoh who sits on his throne even to the firstborn of the slave girl who is behind the millstones, all the firstborn of the cattle as well. What you've got to remember is that Pharaoh was considered deity in the flesh. He was literally God, and his son was, if you will, God in training because his son was going to take over the throne after he died. And so if Pharaoh can't protect his own son, then the weakness that he has as a man is actually truly going to be exposed. You also need to understand that in antiquity, no other people had a fascination with death quite like the Egyptians. The Egyptians, they, they, their priests, their priesthood, they thought that they had the power 
to take someone who died and give them safe passage into the afterlife. That is why the Egyptians are just uh, so fascinated with mummifying their bodies and putting them in tombs and putting the stuff around them because those priests held the authority that when you die, I can make sure that your life happens well. And now all of a sudden, these folks are being told, Yahweh's the one in charge of life and death. He's the one who has the authority and power whether you live or whether you die. Matter of fact, I'm going to take Pharaoh's son out as well. The firstborn son was symbolic of the inheritance of the family. He was the descendant who would take over. He was the strength. He was the virility of a nation. You need to understand that when you take out the firstborn, it cripples the nation. Look at verse 6. Moreover, there shall be a great cry in all the land of Egypt. Where else in the story have you heard that little phrase, great cry? Remember if you go back the burning bush, God comes to Moses and says, I have heard a what? Great cry from my people in their bondage, and I am going to deliver them. Now what God is saying is, my people cried out to me about how you treated them. Moses is saying, now there's going to be another great cry in the land, but it's not going to be God's people. It's going to be your people. There'll be a great cry in all the land of Egypt, such as there has not been before, and such as shall never be again. But against any of the sons of Israel, a dog shall not even bark. They didn't know my dog. Whether against man or beast, that you may understand how the Lord makes a distinction between Egypt and Israel. There is going to be a great cry tonight, but it won't be among the Israelites. And when an Israelite walks down the street... Not even a dog is going to bark against them, for you will know that my people are different from you. My God is stronger than your God. And look at verse 8. And all these your servants will come down to me and bow themselves before me, saying, Go out, you and all the people who follow you, and after that I will go out. And he went out from Pharaoh in hot anger. In Hebrew, hot anger literally means hot anger. Do you know why Pharaoh was upset? Here's why I think Pharaoh is upset. He is so tired of trying to make sense to this stubborn man and the pride of this man. And he understands that if Pharaoh would have bent and repented after the first plague or the second plague or the third plague, then all the plagues would have stopped and God would have brought a revival to all the Egyptians and they would be blessed for it. But he also realizes Pharaoh... Because you will not submit now, hundreds of thousands of people will die tonight because of your pride. As the king goes, so goes the people. Let's go to chapter 12. Now the Lord said to Moses and Aaron in the land of Egypt, This month shall be the beginning of months for you. It is to be the first month of the year to you. God is saying here to, through Moses, the Passover is going to start the Israelite year starting now. The Passover for us would have been our March-April time period. Uh, the, the, the month that this happened now is a month called Abib on the Israelite calendar. It was the same time of the year where it, Abib literally means ear month. is when the ear of the barley was still in the bud. And so when they got uh, sent to slavery under the Babylonians in 5, or 586 B.C., they, they had two calendars the Israelites followed. They followed a religious calendar and a civil calendar. After the Babylonian captivity, they just followed the civil calendar. So the month of Bib got changed or renamed to the month of Nisan. And that's the month that is seen in today. It's our March, April, springtime Passover celebration. Now, let's look at verse 3. This is going to be real good. Can I say that? It's not, I'm not saying my sermon is going to be good. My sermon is going to be eh. But this text is awesome. Speak to all the congregation of Israel. Now that word congregation, first time used in the Hebrew here, first time used about Israel, it's used 150 times after this in your Old Testament. It's the first time that Israel as a nation is, is, is singled out as a religious identity group of people. Speak to all the congregation of Israel saying, on the 10th of this month, they are each one to take a lamb for themselves, according to their father's households, a lamb for each household. Now, if the household is too small for a lamb, then he and his neighbor nearest to his house are to take one according to the number of persons in them. According to what each man should eat, you are to divide the lamb. This also should sound familiar to you if you know the Exodus story later when he talks about the manna and how to take the manna. Same type lingo. He says, you know, when you go get the manna, get just enough for you and your family. Don't get too much and don't try to get tomorrow's because it's going to all perish tonight and it won't be any good to you tomorrow. 
Same type lingo. And he goes on. He says in verse 7, Moreover, they shall take some of the food, or some of the blood. Let's go back to verse 6. I missed that one. Verse 6, You shall keep it until the 14th day, this is the Lamb, of the same month, when the whole assembly of the congregation of Israel is to kill it at twilight. And we don't have anything in our culture that connects to this whatsoever that we can get our hands around. Except one little thing I can think of. You take the lamb or the goat on the 10th, on the 14th you're going to kill it. What's in between the 10th and the 14th? How many days? Four days. You've got kids with a cute little lamb for four days. What's happening in four days? They've named it. Right? They've named it Fluffy or Cloud, right? Or Cutie. And they have fallen in love with this lamb. And you're having to explain to your kids... Don't get too attached. We're going to eat that lamb. In four days, we're going to have to kill that lamb. Now the question then comes, why did the lamb have to die? Let's keep going to the text. It says, verse 7, Moreover, they shall take some of the blood and put it on the two doorposts and on the lintel of the houses in which they eat it. They shall eat the flesh that same night roasted with fire, and they shall eat it with unleavened bread and bitter herbs. Why unleavened bread? Leaven in your Old Testament scriptures uh, carries the same connotation or meaning of evilness or wickedness. You were supposed to eat unleavened bread, clean, pure, and you're do, to do it with bitter herbs. Why bitter herbs? Bitter herbs had two thoughts here. Number one is a reminder, and the reminder of the years to come, every time they celebrate Passover, the bitterness and a reminder of what it was like to be enslaved by another people as slaves for that whole period of time. Also, it was a reminder of the bitterness that you need to repent with when you break God's law in the future to come. So that, that bitter herbs would be a constant reminder of those two things. If you go to um, verse 9, do not eat any of it raw or boiled at, at all with water, but rather roasted with fire, both its head and its legs along with its entrails, and you shall not leave any of it over until the morning, but whatever is left of it until morning you shall burn with fire. Now, you got to remember, you're hearing these instructions for the first time. You've never done anything like this before. And he's telling you exactly how to do it, when to do it, why, not why to do it. And, and it's just confusing. But what's amazing about these people is they've seen God move. And so they're willing and ready to do whatever Moses tells them to do, even if it doesn't make sense. You see, that's really what the New Testament obedience looks like for the believer. We do whatever God tells us to do, however he tells us to do it, even when it doesn't make sense. Now look at verse 11. You shall eat it in this manner, with your loins girded, your sandals on your feet, and your staff in your hand. And you shall eat it in haste. It is the Lord's Passover. That's another phrase we don't use much, your loins being girded. What that means is you would gird your loins when you're about to go out, when you're about to go on a journey, you're about to take a trip. It'd be the equivalent of us tucking our shirt tail in, it's time to go. If you've got a robe, you're tucking your robe in, you're ready to move. And he says, when you eat this meal, you've also got to eat with your sandals on. Now the Israelites would not have eaten with their sandals on, they would have taken their sandals off before they go into the house, and that was respectful. He says, this meal's different. You've got to eat ready for a journey. You've got to eat with your sandals on. You've got to eat holding your staff. Now, I think one reminder the staff is, is a constant reminder that you're going to have to lean on me and trust the Lord, something outside yourself, on this journey. I think it's also amazing in Psalm 51 where David says, Thy rod and thy staff, I'm sorry, Psalm 23, thy rod and thy staff, they comfort me. And so you're sitting there, you're eating, you're eating, you're ready to go, your loins are girded, your sandals are on, you're holding your staff. You still don't know where you're going, when you're going, or why you're going. But to this point, these folks have seen enough of this God to say, I'm going to do whatever Moses tells me. Let's go to verse 12. For I will go through the land of Egypt on that night, and I will strike down all the firstborn in the land of Egypt both man and beast, and against all the gods of Egypt, I will execute judgments. I am the Lord. And the blood shall be a sign for you on the houses where you live. And when I see the blood, I will pass over you, and no plague will befall you to destroy you when I strike the land of Egypt. Now, if you'll go down to verse 23, something really interesting here. He says, The Lord will pass through to smite the Egyptians. 
And when he sees the blood on the lintel and on the doorpost, the Lord will pass over the door and will not allow the destroyer to come into your houses to smite you. Two different people here in this situation. There's the Lord and there's the destroyer. The picture the Bible lays out is the destroyer is given permission by God to execute judgment through these homes this night. If the Lord doesn't direct that destruction, everyone's going to die that night. Not just the firstborn, not just the Egyptians, everybody's going to die because that's what the destroyer does. And the picture is, the word Passover, a better translation I believe is to hover over. The picture is that the Lord is going to go before the destroyer and there are certain homes shown by the blood on the doorpost and the Lord will actually hover over that home so when the destroyer comes, he cannot enter that home. He does not have permission based on the blood of the door and he will go to the next home. Incredible picture in your Bible. What's amazing about this too is these folks, you don't see them debate this at all with Moses. I mean, you don't get, you see, you see we kind of grew up thinking that, you know, commitment is just a feeling. I don't feel like being committed. Biblically, commitment is not a feeling. It's holding to a promise that's been made, okay? You need to know that sometimes I don't feel like studying for my sermons for you. I mean, I, one thing I've realized, 20 years now in ministry, Sunday comes every week. It, 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 spring break, people are like, what are you going to do for spring break? Work on a sermon? right? It comes every week. There are Tuesdays and Wednesdays where I don't feel like studying. There are times where someone wants to unload their heartache on me and I don't feel like listening. There are times I want to look at them and say, here's your problem. Read your Bible more. Quit sinning. Next. The wonderful counselor that I am. There are times I don't feel like being compassionate. There are times I don't feel like forgiving someone. There are times I feel like holding a grudge. There are times I don't feel like being kind to someone that's not a kind person. There are times I don't feel like keeping my marriage vow. There are times I don't feel like praying. There are times I don't feel like having a quiet time. A guy wrote a book one time, it's called, I Don't Feel Called, Thank the Lord. You see, the problem is we wait for a feeling. I didn't feel God calling me. If you're a believer, God's called you. (laughs) We're all called. And it's not based on a feeling. It's based on a commitment to a promise that's been kept. I don't think these folks sat around and said, lamb, really? I hate lamb. Mom, cheesy spaghetti night. Mom, meatloaf. (laughs) I don't think they sat around and said that. I don't think there was, honey, you are not going to track blood on my doorway. I just swept that doorway off. That is gross. I think these folks just did what they were asked. Look at verse 23. For the Lord will pass through to smite the Egyptians. When he sees the blood on the lintel on the two doorposts, the Lord will pass over the door, not allow the destroyer to come to your house to smite you. And you shall observe this event as an ordinance for you and your children forever. It will come about when you enter the land which the Lord will give you, as he has promised that you shall observe this rite. And it will come about when your children will say to you, What does this rite mean to you? That you shall say, It is a Passover sacrifice to the Lord who passed over the houses of the sons of Israel in Egypt when he smote the Egyptians but spared our homes and the people bowed low and worshipped. You see, we have teachable moments like that as parents too, don't we? So Forever generations, people say, Dad, why are we doing this lamb thing again? I hate lamb. Let me tell you what God did. Our fathers were in Egypt. Here's what God did. We get that with our kids, don't we? Hey, I was over at Timmy's house. They don't pray before every meal. When the food goes, they just go. Dad, why do we have to pray? But let me tell you why we pray. Because we realize everything that we have is from the Lord. And if it wasn't for the grace of God, this meal would not be provided for us, and I wouldn't get to live till tomorrow. But because he's graciously given us something to eat, we get to live another half day. Dad... I go hang out at my friend's house and spend the night. They don't have to get up early and go to church, especially when you lose an hour of sleep. Why do we have to go to church? But let me tell you, we go to church because we are the scattered community of the living God. And we are commanded in Hebrews to not forsake the assembly of us together. So once a week we come together, we worship our king together, so we'll be better equipped to go represent him in a fresher, newer way the next week and that God will be glorified and honored. 
Or maybe you get this one. Hey, what's up with the juice and the little cracker thing? And why can't I get some more juice? Great question, buddy. Let me tell you. That little cracker thing, that represents and means to us that Jesus Christ physically, literally broke his body for us. And that when we partake of that, we remember all that Jesus has done. We drink that juice. That's a reminder that the blood of Christ was shed for the forgiveness of our sins. And because he died, we get to live. And that's why we remember, son. And that's what these folks were able to tell their kids. Look there in chapter 12, verse 29. It came about at midnight that the Lord struck all the firstborn in the land of Egypt from the firstborn of Pharaoh who sat on his throne to the firstborn of the captive who was in the dungeon and all the firstborn of cattle. And Pharaoh rose in the night, he and all his servants and all the Egyptians, and there was a great cry in Egypt for there was no home where there was not someone dead. In every home that night someone died. It was either a son or a lamb, but someone died. Verse 31, then he called for Moses and Aaron at night and said, rise up, get out from among my people, both you and the sons of Israel, and go, worship the Lord as you have said, take both your flocks and your herds as you have said, and go, and, go. and it's a very interesting thing he says there, and bless me. You win, you're God stronger. Would you ask him to bless me the way he's blessing you guys? And if you look down at verse 37, now the sons of Israel so... Uh, journeyed from Ramesses to Sukkoth, about 600,000 men on foot, aside from children. The question is always asked, how do you come up with a two million number that people use of the Israelites leaving? 600,000 men left that night, the Bible says. If you take their wife, you take their kids, the general consensus is it was about two million people. Could have been 1.9, could have been 2.2, but about two million people left. Can you imagine the scene Everybody in the greater metroplex of Austin and the surrounding areas walking together through the streets of Egypt and all they hear is the moaning and crying and shrieks of mothers and fathers holding their dead sons. I imagine some of those mamas in that train of people grabbed their son and just pulled him to and they were crying, Lord, thank you for not killing my son tonight. You see, God was gracious and he didn't kill all of Egypt that night. God's going to leave a window for Egypt for later generations to repent and come to a true knowledge of who he was based on what they hear the God of Israel did. Paul says that Jesus is our Passover lamb who was sacrificed for us. The blood on the door, I think, represents four things. I've written them down in your focus if you want to jot a few notes down. I think the blood, number one, rec represents satisfaction. I asked myself the question. I said, self, why did they have to put blood on the doors to mark their homes? Because, see, the first three plagues happened to everybody, right? Plagues four through nine happened to just the Egyptians, not the Israelites in Goshen. So God obviously could tell, that's an Egyptian cow, I'll take him out. That's an Israelite cow, I'll save him. God did not need the blood on the door to know who was an Israelite and who was an Egyptian. Why was the blood on the door? The blood was a sign, the Bible calls. I think a better word is token. A token to show that God's wrath on this home is satisfied. It was a sermon being preached on every door. And see, during, during this time, the door... Was, was more than just a door. It was the identity of you as a family unit. The, the, the ancient folks believed that the good spirits were on one side of your doorpost and the bad spirits were on another side of your doorpost. And so what Moses says in this sermon on every door in every home is the blood of the Lamb has satisfied the wrath of God. How do you know this God exists? Because you hear the loud welling and cries of those that their presence and obedience did not satisfy this God. I think it was a verbal and a visual reminder. Number two, I think it also served as protection. The word, another Hebrew word for Passover, Pesah, it comes from the word Pesh, which literally means to spread one's wings over and to protect. The Passover was a hovering over, a protection of God over the Israelite families. That we are protected, that 
the same blood of the Lamb, Jesus Christ, the slain Lamb before the foundations of the earth, he was called the Lamb of God, now protects us from the wrath of God. The God who came in wrath has come now in peace. Number three, I believe it also means cleansing. Chapter 11, verse 7 says, that you may know the Lord makes a distinction between the Israelites and the Egyptians. There was a cleansing. They used hyssop. Hyssop was a, a bush that they would use in cleaning rites as Israelites. They would use it to medicate and pray over uh, people suffering with leprosy. David says in Psalm 51, and he's asking God to forgive him, would you cleanse me with hyssop, and then I'll truly be cleansed. There was a cleansing that took part. 1 John chapter 1 says the blood of Jesus Christ cleanses us from all sins. Number four, substitution. Revelation chapter 13 verse 8 says John calls the Jesus the lamb that was slain before the foundations of the earth. John chapter 1 verse 29, John the Baptist sees Jesus come and he says, Behold the lamb of God who takes away the sins of the earth. Are you starting to make the connection of who Jesus is in the Passover? He is the slain lamb. He is the one that was unblemished. He was the one chosen by the Father. And his death enables us not to have to kill lambs every year. There has been one lamb slain for the good of all that all sins would be forgiven if you trust in obedience in the blood of Christ. We have a door over here. It's really interesting. We think maybe the door might look something like this. The Bible says that take the blood from the basin. I think basin is a weak English translation of the Hebrew word. I think the Hebrew word there better translated, take blood from the threshold. I want you to picture this. You, you've got your four-day family pet. You're out on the threshold. Your children are standing here. Your wife's standing here. They're all crying. They all hate you. <laughs> Not fluffy. And you slay this animal in front of them. When we think they took the blood from the basin, I don't think it was a bucket necessarily like this. I think there was blood all over the threshold of this doorway. And he would take the hyssop and he would literally bend down the blood that's in the threshold and he would pick up blood from the threshold. The Bible says they took the blood on the door and you were to put it on both doorposts. I think it was done in haste. I don't think it was done neatly. And you covered your family with the blood from the threshold of the lamb. The Bible says that they were to go into their home, close their door, and not to come out before the morning. Can you imagine locking yourself up with your family in the house and you hear this wailing going on all night long? And the only reason you're not crying is because of that lamb's blood on your doorpost that you did in obedience, even though you didn't know why. Question I have for us. Why did the Passover have to happen? Could God not just have finished this thing after Plague 9? Why did Egyptian little boys have to die? I think one of the big reasons for the Passover is God had to show his people, you've got to figure out a new way to relate with me. You were worried for 430 years of how are you going to be safe in front of this Pharaoh. Now you've got to be concerned how are you going to be safe in front of this God. You better have reverence. You better do what I tell you to do. You better do it how I tell you. When you do it, you get blessed. When you don't, it's going to be some long nights. We think of reverence. I have people come up to me every once in a while, and it's kind of silly, but, well, you're the preacher here, right? Yeah. Why don't you wear a tie? Do you not revere God? I don't care if you wear a tie. I like suits. I like ties. I like jeans. I like, I like that we wear different things here. But me wearing a tie doesn't mean I respect God more. You know what means I respect God more? Do I love my spouse well? Do I obey him? Am I kind? Am I spirit-filled? God doesn't look at the 
garments of what you wear. He looks at the heart. And I think there's a lot of guys in ties who love Jesus all their heart. And I think there's a lot of guys in ties that it's religion. I think you could be sitting here with a t-shirt and shorts and not give a rip about God. And you could be sitting here with a t-shirt and shorts and love Jesus all your heart. God looks at the heart. And I think he's trying to teach these people, you're going to revere me. I'm going to love you. I'm going to cleanse you. I'm going to protect you. I'm going to even give a substitute for you. But don't get trivial with me. I'm not your buddy. I'm not your co-pilot. I'm not your dude to hang out with. I am the living God who creates all things. That's why I think it's funny when people decide whether they want to trust in Jesus or not. It's not your choice. God allows you to trust in him. I mean, we are playing games. See, the thing is, the Passover is going to come again. And based on whether you put your faith and trust in the blood of the lamb or not determines what happens that night. You see, when the Passover lamb comes back again, you've got all these options now, what you want to put your focus in, your time, your priorities, your resources. But that day, that night, that coming of that lamb is going to say there's one priority, and it's me. This past week is kind of a religious week for our culture. There's a, there's a Tuesday in our culture where people just indulge because Wednesday is going to be Ash Wednesday. You might have seen people this past week and people put an ass cross on their forehead. And I get asked, hey, you're religious. Why don't you put an ass cross on your forehead? Do you not love God? Let me give you my honest answer on that. First of all, the Bible doesn't tell me to do it. But here's my honest answer. When I think about what Jesus Christ did for me on the cross, it makes my stomach turn for me to parallel, now I'm going to give up chocolate. <laughs> now if you want to give up chocolate, give up chocolate. If I give up chocolate, it's because I'm fat, right? I need to lose some weight, no more chocolate. But don't put the comparison in, Jesus did this for me. I've got to do something for him. I'll give up chocolate. Religion says the blood is not enough. I've got to add to it through my work, through my efforts, through my goodness, so that God will protect me and cleanse me and be pleased with me. That's religion. Christianity says the blood is enough. And you can't add to it. And it's not what you wear. It's not what you do. It's not what you don't do. It's not being religious. It's not coming to a building. It's not bowing. It's not spinning around. It's not putting ash in your forehead. It is about loving Jesus. And that's what we do. I love traditions. I'm a tradition guy. I love traditions. And if you want to do that tradition, that's fine. But don't in any way think that you're adding to what Jesus has done or that you can parallel not taking chocolate to it, or not drinking Cokes. John the Baptist said, Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the earth. You see, there were no altars in Egypt. This door with the blood on it became everyone's altar that night. That was their family altar. The question I have this morning is, or this afternoon, do we live as those about to take a journey? Is this your home, or do you realize you're, as Peter says, an alien and a stranger, as Paul says, a sojourner, that this is not our home, this is not our destination. We don't fall in love with the things of this earth because this is the wilderness. Nothing wrong with having a portfolio. Don't trust in it. I know a lot of miserable, rich people. There is nothing this world can give you that's going to bring you ultimate joy and satisfaction. Maybe fun for a while. It's fun to have money and go buy something. But then what happens is then you got to buy something else. There's been one price paid, and it is precious and priceless, and there's nothing else this world can give you that can touch it. The blood of the lamb that has been slain for you. So we live this life as those in haste, with our loins girded, holding our staff, awaiting the coming of that glorious day. How would you live different this week if you knew God was coming back at the end of it? 
Would you worry about the same things that you're going to worry about this week if you knew he was coming back at the end of this week? Would you get as discouraged if you knew he was about to come back? Would you get depressed if you knew he was about to come back? Would you get anxious? Would you worry? Because I got news for you. It may not be this week, but he's coming back. And whether it's 50 years from now or this week or 200 years from now, it doesn't change the fact that the Passover is going to come again. And we will trust in the blood of the Lamb. We get the honor this morning of taking communion together, which is just perfect for what we're celebrating. I'm going to ask our ushers to come forward. They're going to pass the elements out to you. One thing a little different is we've combined the elements in the same thing. So take two cups out, and the bottom cup has the bread in it. So take two cups out, hold those elements. In a couple of minutes, we're going to take those together. But as you hold those elements right now, I want you to think about the blood of the Lamb that was slain for you so that we can have a relationship with our perfect, righteous, holy Father. Fathers, we come to your table this morning. You tell us in Scripture to have our hearts evaluated. I pray this to be a time of confession, a time of coming clean before you so that you can cleanse us all anew. I pray it to be a time of contrition, a time of encouragement, a time of joy a time of remembering the ultimate price that you paid for us so that we could be protected and cleansed and have fellowship with you. It's in your name we pray. Amen. often wonder what things we'll see in heaven and I wonder if there'll be things from the Bible that were great victories that we'll see and I don't think there'll be things that remind us of failures. I don't think we'll see the shekels that Judas gained to betray Jesus in heaven but I often thought there'll be a door maybe in the corner somewhere but I think the difference is it'll have a cross on it and it'll be a reminder to the New Testament saint as well as a real picture to the Old Testament saint of what the Passover is all about. I'm going to ask you to stand. When they ate their Passover meal, they stood and ready for a journey. And that's what we're about to do this week. We're about to live the, the journey of the week. The night that Jesus celebrated the Passover with his men, he held up some bread and he says, this is my body which is broken for you. And I don't think those men understood that that night. I don't think they understood what he was saying. I think it was later that that truly made sense. They were still figuring out a way to, that he wouldn't have to die. And just like Peter and James and those guys would argue with him about it the same way an eight-year-old kid would argue when their dad was going to slay the lamb. Jesus says, I am the lamb of God. Take, eat, remember. He held a cup that night. and I can't imagine what it would be like for Jesus to look at that cup and know that he was about to spend his night pouring out his blood for bozos like those guys. <laughs> and we're bozos. And God loves us, even though we're bozos at times. I think he took a cup and he said, this is my blood. You are protected. You are cleansed when you trust in me. Take, drink, and remember. Father, today, we remember. And I pray that we would live the journey called life well this week if you do not come back before we meet again. I pray that you would come back. I'd love for this to be the last sermon I ever have to preach, God. But Father, if you choose not to, we'll come back, we'll worship again. And we'll celebrate again. And I pray that each day, each moment this week, we would remember the precious gift of life that your son gave up 
so that we could have. I pray that we would live in such a way to honor you. It's in your name we pray. Amen.